Okay, I think we can begin. Uh, so it's a pleasure to uh, introduce Professor Adam Muzzin, uh, who's here giving our colloquium today. Adam got his PhD from the University of Toronto and held uh, postdoc positions at, at Yale, Leiden, was a Cavalry Fellow at, at um, Cambridge, before moving on to uh, York University, where he's a professor. Um, so he's going to be telling us about how to build uh, a big galaxy with uh, IKEA tools and equipment. So. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. Fabulous to be here at Carnegie. Uh, and hello to everyone online. I hope everyone can hear me online. Um, let me know if, it's, if all the technology is not working. Um, so I'm going to tell you today about how to build a big galaxy. Uh, some of the people sitting in the audience already noticed this logo. Uh, it's not by mistake that I put that up uh, because the analogy I'm going to make is that at the moment, you know, in terms of how big galaxies are made, we really kind of understand all the pieces that we have to put together to make a big galaxy. Uh, but the plan, you know, the blueprint on how to do this looks more like the kind of instructions you get from this company than really a true blueprint. And we're really working towards a blueprint, but I will make the case that we're not quite there yet. So coming here, I wanted to give a fabulous talk. And I didn't know how to do that. So of course I went to Google and I said, how do I give a great talk? And Google said, the only way to give a good talk is you must tell a story. And I went, okay, I can tell a story, uh, but how do I do that? So I went to Google and I said, how do I tell a story? And they said, well, in order to tell a story, every great story has a protagonist. And then I thought, uh-oh, I wanna talk about galaxies. How can I possibly tell a great story with a protagonist about galaxies? And then I realized there is a perfect protagonist for the story that I'm going to tell you today. And that's this galaxy here, which some of you may recognize. This is M87, all right? This is arguably the most massive galaxy in the Virgo cluster, but definitely one of the most massive galaxies that we know in the local universe. And what I wanna to do today is I wanna tell you the life history of M87 from when it was very first born in the early universe to what it looks like now, which is actually kind of dull, right? But I'll show you that its life in the past was a lot more exciting. So M87 is our protagonist for today. Before I you know, tell you the life history of M87, I need to tell you maybe a little bit about our main character, right? Put M87 in context. So let me, let me spend two or three slides to tell you about M87. Uh, M87 is, as I said, the most massive nearby galaxy. And you can see that this is the galaxy stellar mass function. And I'll use this a few times in the talk, so I'll spend a second on it here. It's basically a volume density of galaxies as a function of their stellar mass, all right? It's a histogram, very, very simple. Uh, it has two components, a sort of a power law here at low masses and a declining exponential at high masses, which is uh, often fit with something called the Schechter function, which probably many people are aware of. The red star on this plot and the subsequent plots are M87, okay? So you can see M87 is really at the very, very tip of the Schechter function. It's among the most massive nearby galaxies that we know about. And if you plot it on another diagnostic that we classically use in galaxy evolution, the so-called color mass or color magnitude diagram, you see that in the local universe, there's a bimodality. There's red galaxies here, blue galaxies here. Presumably these don't form stars, presumably these do. And here's M87 way off in the corner here, very, very massive and very, very red. Okay, it's on the sort of what we would call the so-called tip of the red sequence, very quiescent. Another uh, scaling relation that galaxies in the local universe obey is what we call the mass age relation. So this is age of the stellar population versus mass. More massive galaxies have older stellar populations. And you can see M87 sitting right up there at the tip of the mass age relation as well. Not particularly old or particularly young for its mass, but overall a very, very old stellar population. There's also a mass metallicity relation in the local universe. And again, M87 sits on the very, very tip of the mass metallicity relation, maybe slightly elevated relative to average, but you know, basically within the one sigma scatter. But it is a very, very metal rich galaxy. You can see here actually slightly supersolar metallicity, right? So M87 is filled with old, but very metal rich stars. And then the last piece of the puzzle I wanna show you, of course, is M87 has an enormous black hole, right? Absolutely enormous. Um, over a billion solar masses black hole. Here it is on the black hole mass dispersion relation. And a few years ago when I gave this kind of talk, I, you know, this is the picture I would show, which I would say, look, you know, there's a black hole in M87 because you can see the jet coming off it. But of course, one of the things that's changed over the last couple of years is, you know, we actually 
took a picture of M87's black hole with the Event Horizon Telescope. So, you know, there is M87's black hole, which I think is, you know, one of the greatest accomplishments in, in astronomy, period. It's an amazing thing to look at, you know, the sphere of influence of a black hole. So this is what we need to put together to understand our main character, right? These are the pieces of the big galaxy puzzle. We need to form a huge amount of stellar mass, right? A hundred trillion solar masses of stars, but we need to form that really early on in the history of the universe because the stellar population is really, really old. When we do it, we need to keep lots of metals, right? The stellar population is super solar, so you can't have these crazy feedback models that blast metals everywhere. You have to retain most of the metals. But yet, from forming all these stars, you ultimately have to quench star formation at relatively early times. So you can see there's a dance going on here that's going to be needed to make M87 work out. And then in the process of doing this dance of forming a lot of stars, keeping the metals, but not quenching too much, you need to make a massive black hole, all right? So we can do this. I'll show you that we can do this, but it's not necessarily so simple. So there's two ways that we can look at studying galaxies like M87, all right? And I'm going to show you both of these. I would broadly categorize them into what we call galaxy archaeology and what we call look-back studies. And mostly I will talk about this, but I will talk a little bit about this. Um, probably dating myself a little bit for how old I am by putting these people up. I mean, the young people probably don't even know who these guys are, but in the 80s, you know, these were my heroes, right? So I can't help but want to put them up. So galaxy archaeology is really about studying galaxies in the nearby universe and trying to wind the clock back, studying galaxies like M87. The strength of this is that, you know, you get really high quality data, beautiful spectra, very high signal to noise. But the problem of doing everything in the local universe is that you have to take that really high signal to noise data and somehow wind the clock back, you know, up to 14 billion years. And that requires complex models, simulations, all that kind of stuff, which have a lot of uncertainties. Doing a look back study is very complementary, right? The idea is here we just look at galaxies in the distant universe, at redshift three, four, five, six, whatever, and see what galaxies like M87 look like. The challenge is, of course, as we go to these high redshifts, the quality of your data is very limited. Um, you often have to use mostly photometry, not spectroscopy, and rely on these horrible things called photometric redshifts that I would advise you never ever to use unless you have to. Um, so what I wanna do is I wanna talk a bit about both. What I want to start with is talk a little bit about some results from the local universe to predict what we might see in the high redshift universe. So let's start with a couple slides here. The classic thing that people have done in the last decade or so is try to reconstruct the star formation history of galaxies like M87. Um, and to show you what this looks like, this is a paper from Conroy from uh, 10 years ago now, where he basically stacked all the Sloan spectra of massive galaxies like M87. And you get a beautiful spectrum when you stack them all, right? All of these little bumps and wiggles are real. They're not low signal to noise. It's basically like an infinity signal to noise plot here. And if you understand stellar evolution, you can wind the clock backward and predict what the star formation history of galaxies like this are like. And that's sort of what Thomas has done here on the right-hand side. And sort of two generic results come out of this. The curves here, as you go from blue to red, are galaxies of lower mass to increasingly higher mass. This is basically star formation rate. It's actually specific star formation rate because it's divided by mass. But think of it as star formation rate versus look back time. Or if you prefer redshift, it's along the top. And two things uh, come out of this. The first is uh, if you look at massive galaxies, the peak of their star formation history is much earlier than lower mass galaxies. And that's consistent with, I showed you with M87 having a very old stellar population. But the other thing you see is that the dispersion in this star formation history is very narrow for massive galaxies and it's very broad for lower mass galaxies. So from winding the clock backward on these spectra, massive galaxies form in big bursts in the high redshift universe Lower mass galaxies like the Milky Way form more gradually over cosmic time. At least that's the prediction. But there's one more piece of this that you need to unwind, which is that when stars form is not necessarily when the galaxy forms. So this is from uh, the Eagle simulation, and there's a lot on this plot, but I'll go through it for a second. What it's showing you is that it's the assembly of a galaxy you know, through mergers, basically. And this is redshift here. And this is all the different pieces of this galaxy that ultimately you know, merge together into this main body progenitor by redshift zero. And it's showing you that you know, when the stars form is not necessarily when the galaxy forms. And the way to plot this quantitatively is to put something here like a mass assembly time versus a star formation epoch. Now, if galaxies form all their stars in situ in the main galaxy, 
you would basically have the assembly time equal to the star formation history, and things would lie on this line. And if you look carefully, low mass galaxies are in blue, and in fact, most of them lie on the line, which is telling you that most of their assembly is just from forming stars inside the main galaxy. Whereas you go to higher mass galaxies, you see they all tend to low to lie below the curve, which is telling you that the star formation is early and the assembly is late, okay, kind of like this. And that's generically what all simulations predict, including, you know, this is from Eagle, but it sort of is of many of the cosmological simulations, okay? So early star formation, but late mass assembly. So that's kind of what we're expecting to see when we look at distant galaxies. We're expecting to see massive galaxies forming a lot of stars at early times, but maybe merging together at late times. So what do we see when we do a look back study? Well, before I do that, you're probably sitting there going like, what does even a look back study mean, right? Like, what do you mean? I just like look at M87 in the past. It's not so easy, right? If you take a picture of the night sky and up until recently, this was the best picture of the night sky. This is the Hubble ultra deep field. I don't know, I, I keep deciding if some of these web fields are deeper yet. I don't think any of the web fields are quite deeper than the UDF yet. Um, so this is still the best picture of the night sky. And you say, well, I want to understand, you know, what the progenitors of M87 look like. All I have is a big spattering of galaxies, right? Like, how do I possibly do this, right? This galaxy kind of looks like M87, maybe, you know, at some redshift. So is the progenitor of this at redshift one, maybe, you know, this red thing over here, and then the progenitor at redshift three is this faint thing here, or maybe the progenitor of this at redshift one is this blue thing, and then it's progenitor at redshift three, like how in the hell can I possibly dream of connecting the dots, right? It's kind of crazy. I just have all these galaxies. And I will argue there are ways of doing this. So I'll show you, I'll show you how we do this, at least the best we can. So what we want to do is we want to connect progenitors and descendants in order to do this look back study. And the way we do this, we actually have to put the evolution of the entire galaxy population in context first, and then we can read out tracks of growth of galaxies like M87. So the way I'm going to do this is with this galaxy stellar mass function. Um, so just to remind you, this is the volume density of galaxies as a function of their mass. And I would argue this is the best tool we have for connecting galaxies over cosmic time. So we've done this study at high redshift. This is now a very old paper um, that I wrote that just looked at the abundance of galaxies at different redshifts. You can see from low redshift up to high redshift. I'm not here to peddle results from 10 years ago. Um, so I will show you that we actually have an update to this that we've been working on very hard that hopefully you will see soon. So this is an update to this old mass function. Again, volume density as a function of mass. This now goes up to redshift six. And as you can see from the x-axis here, it goes about an order of magnitude, one and a half orders of magnitude deeper, okay, where this cut off. And there's some interesting things that you see here. Sorry, I should add, this is basically every photometric data set uh, in the extragalactic community, everything from Cosmos to the UDS to candles to the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, the Hubble Frontier Field, Z4, like every single thing <laughs> that exists, we've combined into this. And there's a few things you see. You don't see a lot of evolution at the low mass end at different redshifts here. You see a huge evolution um, at the sort of typical, you know, M star. And then still not of a lot of evolution for high mass galaxies, which is something that I will talk about. There is a little bit of evolution. This is, you know, seven orders of magnitude here. So there is a factors of a few evolution here, but there's not a whole bunch. And hopefully you'll see this paper soon. Okay, so we're going to use the mass function. And we're going to use the mass function at different redshifts to connect progenitors and descendants. So how can you do this? Well, 10 years ago, the simplest thing that people would do is they would make the assumption that galaxies maintain their rank order in stellar mass over cosmic time. That's a lot of words. What do I mean? Well, what you would do potentially is you would take the galaxies and you would rank them by their mass at a given redshift. So let's start at redshift three and we will line them all up. We'll put the mass of galaxies at the front of the train. We'll put the lower mass galaxies at the back, right? We've rank ordered them. And we're going to assume that that rank order doesn't change, which is based on simulations is actually a remarkably good assumption, although it's not perfect. So if you make that assumption, you can go to redshift one and you can rank order the galaxies again. And of course, all of the galaxies will have grown, right? They all form stars, they merged. But if they maintain that rank order, you can actually see what's growing into what, right? And you can trace this all the way down potentially to redshift zero, and you can tr actually mark out the mass growth of galaxies if you make that assumption and that assumption holds, which I can tell you roughly it does. How would you do that quantitatively? 
So the way you would do that quantitatively is like this. This is a paper that we wrote, uh, Peter Barosi wrote that uh, I was part of now a while ago. These are no longer mass functions. These are actually integrals under the mass function. Okay, so they kind of look like the mass function. And if you think about it, if you're taking the most, say, 100 massive galaxies within a certain volume, that's a fixed cumulative number density, right? It's always the same number density. It's the 100 most massive galaxies within a certain volume at any redshift. And so the way you would write this on this plot is very simple. You just draw a straight line, right? This is a number density. This is a mass. And these are the integrals. And so writing down a fixed cumulative number density allows you to actually look at what mass intersects here. And you can actually just read the mass evolution off now from low redshift up to high redshift or whichever way you want to go, right? Very, very simple if galaxies maintain their rank order in stellar mass, which mostly they do, but we know for a fact they don't, right? For example, one of the problems you know for sure happens because we observe it is, you know, you may have two low mass galaxies like this, right? They find each other in the universe, they merge. Of course, in this situation, it's obviously a train wreck. Merger, I tried, okay. <laughs> you end up with a bigger galaxy, right? Now you have to move it to the front of the train, but of course you've assumed galaxies maintain their rank order. Oh man, you've blown it, right? You've completely blown it. Now you're matching up the wrong things to the wrong things. Okay, so how do we deal with this? Well, what Peter cleverly realized is that we can know the merger rate from simulations, right? We can go into the simulations, we can see how halos merge, we can see what they merge with, and we can basically apply a correction to this fixed cumulative number density. So it's what we call an evolving number density, and it depends on the mass of the galaxies. And if you're interested in doing that, this with your own data, this is a tool that's published. So you can you know, uh, go to his website, you can download this tool, and you can basically just match up the number densities but say for massive galaxies, this is what it looks like, okay? So instead of using a fixed cumulative number density, you use a different, slightly higher number density as you go to higher redshift to account for the fact that mergers are removing galaxies from your sample. And you can see that over sort of short redshift baselines, the correction is not that big because, you know, the number of mergers in a small amount of time is not that high. But as you go to a very large baseline, this correction starts to become a little bit higher. Does these corrections change based on different simulations? Uh, yeah. So good question. There are a few others. They don't change very much. What it changes more on is what mass you're choosing, right? So what I've chosen here are galaxies in this mass range. If you go down here, it can be very, very different, right? Massive galaxies have lots and lots of mergers. Lower mass galaxies, not so much. So you really have less it's about the simulation than it is about the um, mass range you're looking at. Because this actually comes from actually no hydro sims. This is purely dark matter sims that he just looked at the merger of the halos. So the same yes, yeah. There's, there's, there's also, I should put it up, there's work by Tori and also Wellens that have a similar kind of tool. And they all roughly agree. Um, uh, what, what, how should I interpret the redshift two and a half to three? Yeah. Does that tell, tell you something about the level of uncertainty? It does. Uh, yeah. And this is old. So this is based on those old mass functions where at very high masses, at high redshifts, there was, you know, the uncertainty was really big. If I did this now with our updated mass functions, I think you'd see a much nicer slicing through this. But yeah, this was really the pushing the maximum of the data back then. Absolutely. Okay. So. Uh, a student working with myself and Marian Franks in Leiden uh, applied this to basically look at the progenitors of M87. This is Allison Hill. Uh, you can tell she's in Leiden because there's a windmill in the background. Um, and here she is, you know, tracing the evolution of a galaxy like M87 through the integrated mass functions. And this is the answer. So this is the growth history of M87 from basically redshift zero out to redshift five. Okay. And what you see is depends, you know, how you feel about it, but there's pretty rapid growth of this galaxy at early times from redshift, you know, five and a half down to three. It grows by uh, almost a factor of 30 there, and then it slows down a little bit as you go to lower redshift. And I'll show this more in a different way. So one of the, that's the mass growth, which is fast at early times and a little bit slower at late times. The other fun thing you can do is you can actually look at if the star formation in that galaxy is enough to account for the mass growth. So this is mass growth versus redshift. The black is what we measure from that curve I show you. It's really, you know, it's the derivatives. So this is how it's growing. The blue is if you look at the star formation rates of those kinds of galaxies. And what you see is 
At high redshift here, they basically line up. There's a small offset, but for those of you who do star formation rates and stellar masses, you know there tends to be these small systematic offsets between the two. So we argue that you know the star formation and the mass growth agree here, down to about redshift one and a half, and then you really see the star formation die off, but the mass growth continues. And so this really argues for sort of two phases of massive galaxy growth, an early phase that is driven by in situ star formation within the main body, and then a late phase here, which is mostly from mergers with smaller galaxies, okay, which is kind of a fun idea. Now, I really, this is another paper she did, which I really love that unfortunately doesn't get as much attention as, as I would like, but I'm going to uh, pedal it here for you a little bit. When Allison was doing her PhD, she said, well, why should we do this with just M87? I can do this with all the galaxies in the universe and come up with the mass growth histories for everything. And that is what you see here. So this is now tracing galaxies of different masses through this. This is redshift zero. Well, sorry, redshift's on the top. This is redshift zero here up to redshift five or look back time if you like it versus mass. And what you see, of course, is for high mass galaxies, there's this really rapid growth at early times, and then it kind of slows down, whereas lower mass galaxies, it's a little bit more smooth, okay? These curves kind of smooth off. And you see this anti-hierarchical behavior. So the stars here are when galaxies get half their mass, and you see that massive galaxies get half their mass before lower mass galaxies, which is this weird sort of anti-hierarchical assembly of the stellar mass of galaxies. Because if you remember, if you did the dark matter of this, it would be the other way around. Galaxies grow hierarchically in the dark matter, but they grow anti-hierarchically in the stellar mass, which is interesting. And if you're looking at this curve and you were really paying attention at the beginning of the talk, you know, the colors chosen here are not by mistake. You might say, this reminds me of something, right? This actually reminds me of this because you have massive galaxies building up a lot at early times and not so much at late times, lower mass galaxies growing more smoothly. And that's exactly what you saw from the Thomas et al. star formation histories. Huge amount of star formation at early times for massive galaxies and more extended star formation histories for lower mass galaxies. These are completely unrelated measurements, right? This is like Sloan spectra run through stellar population models. These are photometric redshifts on very, very deep sky surveys. And yet they seem to sell at least a somewhat consistent story about how galaxies grow. So, you know, there's an off chance it might even be partially right, right? It's very hard to do both of these things, but I thought this was pretty encouraging that these kind of things come out of the similar kind of analysis. Okay. Yep. Sorry, can go back to yeah, that? absolutely. Um, is, is there anything significant in the fact that the look back time and the redshifts are offset from the bottom of the uh, are they not the same? Maybe it's not on exactly the same cosmology. It may be slightly different cosmologies. Yeah, this is an old paper. This is 2010. So it may be that they use some W map and we were using Planck. Um, I don't think it's a huge offset though, right? I'm, I'm at we got 12 and five and we've got 12 and five. Oh, I see, I see. Yeah, it's, it doesn't line up exactly, but remember that there's really different things, because this is really when the stars formed, and this is really when the galaxy assembled. And remember I showed you that plot in you know Eagle where they weren't exactly the same thing. Um, and so really what we're measuring in the high redshift observations is simply you know when the stars got there. And so they don't necessarily have to agree, um, but the fact that they sort of give you the similar you know feel that massive galaxies are building up very quickly and lower mass galaxies aren't, it gives you some consistency, but they don't have to necessarily match. Okay, take home messages. If you do these look back studies, you see a lot of growth in really massive galaxies like M87 since redshift um, three and five. Massive galaxies are assembled earlier than low mass galaxies. Okay, the universe is anti-hierarchical and stellar mass. Models are actually doing a much better job of predicting this. You saw that in Eagle, but if I got in, you know, if I got into the weeds, I could show you there's a huge amount of deficiencies in the models in getting this actually precisely correct, right? They have sort of the right trends, but in details, there's still a lot of work to do there. Um, and we also have that star formation dominates the mass growth at high redshift, and it's probably mergers at low redshift for a galaxy like M87. Okay, good. I want to take a very quick detour here on a paper that um, submitted to Nature Astronomy a few months ago, which is, I think, a really fun look at the central part of M87. So let's talk about massive ultra-compact galaxies. This is like a classical topic, right? These, the fact that galaxies like the progenitors of M87 are very, very small in size at high redshift, right? And this goes back a very, very long time. Just to put this for, for the non-aficionados in context, this is the effective radius of galaxies as a function of their mass. Effective radius is really just you know, how big they are, okay? Whether they're big and fluffy or tiny and compact, 
All the dots you see are galaxies from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. So you can see there is a mass size relation, right? Massive galaxies tend to be larger. Some of our favorite pals here, like the Milky Way and M87 are on the plot, so you can kind of get a context. Here are galaxies that are the likely progenitors of M87. So they have to move from here up to here. And we've always had a challenge with this, right? Because they do have to grow a little in mass. This is a log plot, but they have to grow by a factor of two or three in mass but they have to grow by up to a factor of 10 in size. And that's tricky, right? It's tricky to do that because you'd think if there are natural processes for doing that, the slope should be something like this, right? This is the mass size relation. Presumably galaxies evolve along this, and yet the slope I'm showing you here is much steeper. So why is that? What's going on, right? And the going wisdom for more than 10 years now has been that galaxies are growing inside out through minor mergers. And this is from Byzantin. She's basically showing you here, this is the mass uh, versus radius of galaxies. So stellar mass density versus their radius. Galaxies like M87 are these dotted and dashed lines. And these high redshift, redshift two things are like these solid lines here. And so the argument that Byzantin and many have made is look, these ultra compact galaxies actually have the right densities within sort of the central kiloparsec. And the way to grow them is you only add a factor of two mass, but if you add it all at large radius, you will basically puff this galaxy up and make it the right size. So the trick is getting stuff out here, and people have argued, look, minor mergers, we can do this, it works out in simulations, everything is okay. And I'm gonna show you that might not be the case. In fact, what I'm gonna show you is that maybe Rachel Bizanson has actually lied to you, and she told me it was okay to say that, so. <laughs> so, what am I talking about? Okay, so here is the best picture we've ever taken of one of these ultra compact galaxies. And I know that because it's in the Hubble ultra deep field. So here it is. Okay, this is from a while ago. This is, you know, whatever it is, 30 Hubble orbits. And you see this really compact galaxy, right? It's like a little nugget. And if you plot its light profile, there's a lot on here, you can ignore it all. The key thing to take, the only thing you need to take away from is, this is, you know, light versus radius. Here's the effective radius. Here's the point spread function of Hubble, which means that you don't actually resolve the galaxy, at least not the effective radius. The effective radius is basically one pixel, and what you're resolving is two, three, four, five effective radius, but you can't see the effective radius. It's too small for Hubble, which means that if you go back to what Byzantin showed you, she tricked you, right? This whole box is one pixel. She drew this nice, beautiful curve through here and said, look, the profile's the same, but she should have just drawn a dot because all she has is one pixel to actually make that statement, all right? So maybe the central regions of these galaxies are not the same. Maybe that's not how galaxies like M87 look. And if you examine this a little bit further, there's some really funky subtleties in here. So if you go to the local universe, and you know, Cormandy has written so many papers on this, and you look at the light profiles of massive galaxies, you find out they come in two sort of you know, categories, if you will, or flavors which are these so-called core galaxies and these so-called extra light galaxies. So what the hell am I talking about? This is, you know, surface brightness versus radius, okay, for one of these core galaxies. The green is the measurement and the black is a Sursic profile fit to that. And the details of that are important. It's just some model that tends to describe galaxies well. And what you see is, you know, damn, it really does describe the galaxy's light profile really, really well until you hit about hundred parsecs and then the galaxy goes flat whereas the Sursic model goes in, okay? And so these have been called core galaxies because they have these flat cores. And the argument has been that these come from merging binary black holes, right? You have two big galaxies that merge, they have big black holes. When they merge, those black holes find each other, they throw out stars like crazy and they basically carve out the central core, which is a reasonable assumption, which may well be true. But what's interesting is the other flavor is exactly the opposite, right? These are what they call extra light galaxies. And again, perfectly well described by a Sursic profile until you hit about 100 parsecs. And then these ones go above the Sursic. Now, the going wisdom for these has been that you have wet mergers, all right? You have like spiral galaxies, gas gets driven down into the center. You form a whole bunch of stars and you create this extra light. And basically this, you know, for those who are fans of Phil Hopkins, this was basically his main PhD work. He wrote a whole series of papers on how this works out. And what I'm gonna show you is that what we're finding is this might not actually work out very well. The challenge is, you know, we'd love to see this at high redshift when all the action is happening. But this is the limit of what HST can see at redshift greater than one. You can't get 100 parsec resolution. It just doesn't work. 
And you'd say, well, we have James Webb out. And I would say, good. And that gets you better, James, you know, depending what wavelength you're observing on, you can do better, but you still can't see 100 parsecs above redshift one. And so the solution to this is gravitational lensing. All right. And so this is a paper that I finally got submitted a few months ago. Um, and this is a gravitational lens of one of these ultra compact galaxies. All right. You can see it there. It's quad imaged. If you're an expert in lensing, you will look at this thing and you will say, oh, that doesn't actually look like a galaxy lens. It looks more like a quasar lens, right? Because I can see one, two, three, four pieces. Normally galaxy lenses are these big arcs. And the reason it looks like a quasar lens is because it is one of these ultra compact galaxies that's so small, you know, it's, it's, not, it's bigger than a quasar, but it's almost point-like. You can see it's not, there is fluff in there, you know, it is resolved, but it is very, very compact. And it's very red too, right? And so the magnification is about a factor of four and a half, which means that we get with Hubble about 125 parsec resolution. And so we can actually measure the inner core structure of one of these things for the very first time, which is kind of fun. Now, it's not as easy as all that. For those of you who do lensing will know that. Here's the lensing model for this thing. And what I've done is here's the best fit CIRSIC uh, model for the galaxy. And I've put in a northeast southwest as well. And I've traced all of that through the lensing model, including the northeast southwest. And you can see how funky it gets in there, right? There is a factor of four and a half magnification, but it's not isotropic, right? You don't just take the galaxy and make it four and a half times bigger. You stretch it in certain directions, which means reconstructing a light profile is a little bit tricky, right? You can see here, image C is sort of stretched east-west, whereas image A is sort of northwest-southeast. So it's not a perfect um, way of doing it. In a longer talk, I would tell you all the details of how to extract a non-parametric light profile, um, but uh, I don't have time for it here. So the question, I can't remember what my next slide is. Is, is that the reconstruction in the source plane? The top one? Yeah. yeah, so this is the best fit CIRSIC in the source plane, and this is it now in the image plane, basically. So we can reconstruct this. Question I have, ah, I know what the next slide is. It's not that. Okay, so <laughs> I want to poll the audience, but I just wanted to do it before I showed the answer. Um, so before I show you what it looks like, we can ask ourselves, what is the descendant of this galaxy, right? So this is redshift, this is mass. Here's our lensed galaxy at redshift 2.75. It has a stellar mass of like 10.6 in log. This is using the Beruzzi thing to trace down what it will look like. And here are a whole bunch of local galaxies for which we have the inner light profiles measured, okay? And what you can see is, uh, sorry, extra light is often called a cusp as well. So I will, uh, when I'm talking, there's cores here and then there's cusps. So when I say cusp, I'm talking about these extra light galaxies. And you can see the descendant of this galaxy sort of lies in this re you know, regime, which is sort of where you transition from a lot of cusps, which are squares, to a lot of cores, which are diamonds. So it could be a core, it could be a cusp, right? It's sort of in that transition regime. So the question I have for the audience is, what do you think it's going to be when I show you the answer on the next slide? Is it gonna be a core or is it going to be a cusp? Anyone wanna vote? Who wants to vote for core? We'll put, got a core, 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 core. Got four cores. Cusp? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. All right, cusps beat cores. You know what the good news is? You're all wrong. <laughs> Everyone's wrong. It's neither. It's actually perfectly described by a CIRSIC profile all the way down to 100 parsecs, okay? There's a lot of information on this slide, so let me show you. The red dots are the light profile that are measured non-parametrically from the image, so that's the measurement. The black, okay, is the black dotted here that follows through the lines is the best fit CIRSIC. And what you can see is it really sits on that black dotted line all the way through, even down to 100 parsecs. It's a perfect CIRSIC. It's not an extra light, and it's not a core galaxy. Now, what's plotted on top of here is the, do the dotted lines are core galaxies, and you can see that this inner part, the cores tend to be depleted, right, compared to the extra lights, which are what you see. And although our galaxy is a perfect CIRSIC, it tends to have a stellar density in this sort of 100 and, you know, parsec range that is similar to cusps. So it's not a cusp, but it has a similar density to cusps. And maybe the way to understand that, of course, is, it, you know, those cusps can't be fit by CIRSICs, because there's too much light out here, right? See, our galaxy has a lack of light there. And it doesn't show up so well on this projector, but going back to where I was, you know, picking on poor old Rachel Bizantson, this is actually one pixel unlensed, right? So you can see that all of this information on here we get because of the lensing. We wouldn't have that. It would just be one dot here. 
So here's what I'm proposing, right? This is a new explanation for cusps. It's not saying now cusps are formed from dissipative wet mergers. What I'm saying is if you take our lensed galaxy and you plot its light profile on top of a cusp, this is what it looks like, right? It actually has exactly the same stellar density in the middle part. It's just lacking the light here. And so my argument to you is that the extra light isn't actually extra. What you're looking at with this extra light is the relic of that ultra compact galaxy that was the progenitor of this low redshift elliptical galaxy, okay? It's just left over and all the mass has been added here, okay? And so the argument I would, I would go for is that galaxies that experience only minor mergers are gonna retain their cusps, right? They're gonna build up light out here, okay? through minor mergers, and they're not gonna alter this. And simulations show that when you pelt a galaxy with minor mergers, it doesn't really alter the central part. Whereas galaxies that also have major mergers, they're gonna have black holes and they're gonna have this carved out basically. Okay, so no dissipative wet mergers required at all. Sorry, Phil. Um, and that's also interestingly consistent with what you expect for fast and slow rotating galaxies. I'll go quickly in the interest of time. Um, but this is sort of a classic plot for aficionados. This is the angular momentum effectively of galaxies versus their velocity dispersion or mass. And what you find out is um, there's this population of what we call in the box here, slow rotators. So they have very little angular momentum, but they have high velocity dispersions. These are sort of your classic ellipticals. And if you color code it by cores versus cusps, you can see all the cores lie down in here, right? This is a classic sign of major mergers. You have a lot of mass, and you have no angular momentum, right? You have mergers coming from every direction. You watch out any net angular momentum and you build up a lot of mass. So actually this explanation really works. The galaxies that don't have major mergers, they retain their cusps and they have a range of angular momentum. So it's kind of a fun new idea. There's a huge future for this. I just showed you one galaxy, but Euclid is being launched in July. And depending on how optimistic you are and how many of these are, Euclid should find something like 1,000 to 10,000 of these lenses. So we will go from one <laughs> to you know three or four orders of magnitude more sources. And of course, the other thing is I showed you our, you know, our result was based on Hubble, but James Webb gets two to three times better angular resolution, depending on what wavelength you want to observe at. And so not only can we get you know, three orders of magnitude more targets, we can observe them with factors of two to three more angular resolution. And though I showed you just one cusp and core kind of thing, we can do a thousand of these in the next 10 years, which I think would be really, really exciting. Okay, so in my last little bit, I'll, I'll try to fit it all in. If you were paying close attention, right, you will feel ripped off because I told you I was telling you the life history of M87 and you would say, well, Adam, you told me the stellar mass of M87 was 11.9 and Allison Hill's curves only go up to 11.5, right? You totally ripped us off, right? M87 is actually over there. It's off the plot, which was an oversight I think we made a few years ago because Allison didn't know I was going to give my talk based on M87. Shame on her. So if it's okay with you guys, I'm just going to use a pencil. Is that okay? Just gonna go, you know, boom. Anyone have a problem with that? No? All right, you're not saying so anyway. Let's just pretend that's the evolution of M87. It seems to fit, it seems to fit. So if this is true, it actually implies some really crazy things, right? This is telling you that the progenitors of M87, if this track is true, will actually have stellar masses, log stellar masses of 11 and a half at redshift four, and they will have log stellar masses of 10 to the 11 at redshift six crazy, crazy high masses for these redshifts. Remembering that the Milky Way has a stellar mass of, you know, log stellar mass of 10 and a half, depending on who you ask. So even at redshift six, M87 is well bigger than the Milky Way, if that track is true. So, you know, if you're a person doing look back studies, there's only one thing you can say about this, right? Of course, which is, uh, I'm trying. All right, so we looked at this. So this is work from Gemily Marsan, who was a postdoc in my group for a few years. This is um, the Ultra Vista survey, which is part of Cosmos. This is very wide, yet also very deep. This is all the candidate massive galaxies we have at high redshift. So this is stellar mass. This is redshift. There's a lot of galaxies here, and there's just a spattering of these things going up to redshift you know, four, five, and six of these masses, but they are there, right? That curve I showed you, there are, very, there are a handful of these things. The solid lines are things we vetted as being reasonable. Some of the smaller things, the SEDs are, are a bit marginal, but there are decent candidates. 
Um, I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to say too much other than if you plot them on this classic color color diagram, at low redshift, you see they sort of break into three categories, roughly one third each, one third looking quiescent, one third being star forming and somewhat blue, and one third being star forming and somewhat red. Um, and so galaxies are just starting to quench. There's just a handful of these quench things at redshift three to four. If you go to the UVJ diagram over here at redshift four to six, it looks a lot messier. But remember that the oxygen three line moves into the V band. And I think using this diagnostic at these redshifts, I think is going to be a problem. You can see it's quite a scatter, but emission lines are potentially polluting this. Um, so unfortunately, I would love to show you spectra. We did get, uh, so Gemlay was, was uh, lucky enough to get James Webb time. We are scheduled for May of 2023. We're going to take spectra of three of these candidates that have stellar masses of like 11 and a half at redshift five. There are their SEDs. This is what we think the near spec spectra will look like in a couple months uh, when we take them, which will be really exciting. Um, several of these have a lot of UV emission, so are potentially still forming some stars. This thing actually looks like a quiescent galaxy. It has a photo Z of redshift five. You know, I hope to come back and show you, uh, you know, a redshift five quiescent massive galaxy if I can. Um, but in the meantime, we've been working very, very hard with Keck uh, doing the survey called Magazine, which is basically looking at these galaxies with MOS fire at redshift three, where it's more manageable. Redshift five is very hard because every, you know, you're getting where most of the features are past the K band and you can't observe. But redshift three is still a really nice regime. So this is from a paper a few years ago. This is a galaxy at redshift three point four spectroscopically confirmed and has a stellar mass, log stellar mass of 11 and a half. Really, really massive galaxy at high redshift. Um, what was exciting is we had a press release on this. I'm Canadian, so this was picked up by the CBC. My mom and dad were really proud of me, right? They're like, Adam, you got on the CBC. Of course, my American collaborators could not have cared less about the CBC, but CNN picked it up and they were really happy, but I called them on the phone because this was a few years ago and told them, look, you don't want to be on the CNN because everybody knows CNN. All right, it's fake news, but it's not. XMM2599 is not fake news. Um, so here's the spectrum, which, you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but this is, you know, probably, uh, at least at the time, before some of the James Webb observations, by far the best spectrum of a redshift three and a half quiescent galaxy we've ever seen. This is about 10 hours on Keck MOS fire. And one of the things we did in this paper is we kind of did the galaxy archaeology thing, but we did it at redshift three. So we could actually run back the star formation history from redshift three and a half. And there's some fun stuff that comes out of that. So this is it. There's a lot on this plot, but I'll take you through it. This is just star formation right here. This is age of the universe on here or redshift along the top. And there's a few events in this galaxy's you know, star formation history, I'll tell you. So first of all, here it is at redshift 3.493. That's when we observe it. And it is quiescent there. So it has a star formation rate effectively of zero. We infer from the stellar population that it stopped forming stars are quenched at redshift 4.1. So that should be when we're starting to see you know, progenitors of M87 quench. It had half its mass assembled at redshift 5.7, OK? And it probably started forming stars uh, vigorously at redshift seven. Okay, so there's some a whole bunch of numbers I fire hosed you, and you would say, "Great, what am I supposed to do with this?" Well, if I go back to the artwork I've done that you know was potentially crazy, we said the galaxies observed at redshift three point five with a mass of eleven and a half. That fits right on the curve, perhaps because I cheated, but perhaps because I was lucky. We said it stopped forming stars at redshift 4.1. That is exactly when you start to see an inflection in this curve from rising rapidly to going flat. It had half its mass assembled at redshift 5.7. That's not quite right, uh, but close. And it really started vigorously forming stars at redshift seven. It's actually not bad, right? It's actually not bad. So XMM2599 may well be what M87 looked like at redshift three and a half. Now, are there progenitors of XMM2599? Have we seen them? I will tell you, absolutely we have. Let me show you. So one of the things that's been emerging from the submillimeter community are these submillimeter galaxies that are very massive and very, very high redshift. So there's a ton on this plot, but the only thing I want you to see is this is this galaxy at redshift six. This is ARP220, but this is its stellar mass right here. And you can see it's very, very massive. And there are handfuls of these galaxies. So if you take these really massive dusty star forming galaxies that submillimeter community is seeing, and you put them on this plot, you get something interesting. So this is from Forrest. This is again, the mass history, the, the mass growth history of this galaxy from the SED. This is mass versus age or redshift. And as you can see, you know, it forms most of its stars in this regime. 
if you plot the mass of these dusty star forming galaxies, they sit right in the middle of what we think is the mass growth history of XMM2599, suggesting that you know these dusty star forming galaxies are really the progenitors of this guy, which is potentially the progenitor of this guy. We've actually seen the progenitor of M87 out to you know redshift six. And if you, you know, one of the things about these submillimeter galaxies is you can actually measure their star formation rates. So this is the, you know, the lines here now indicate the star formation rates. And you can see though, while they point in certain directions, they sort of tend to point in this very rapid growth. And, you know, that makes sense, right? We know submillimeter galaxies are forming tons of stars. Okay. So, you know, why stop there? Redshift six, let's keep going, right? What about the progenitors of M87 between redshift seven and nine? I mean, if you read off this curve, it's saying, look, the progenitor of M87 at redshift eight should have a stellar mass of 10 to the 10, right? Which is now sub the Milky Way, but potentially observable. Have we seen this? And I will say, yes, we have seen that as well. So this is a paper that Mauro Stefanon and myself and others did a few years ago prior to James Webb. This is searching all of Cosmos for the brightest dropouts at redshift eight. We found 16 Y dropouts over the two square degrees. Here they are, you can see they're bright in sort of the Spitzer bands and they eventually drop out in Y and J and the optical. So it's not a perfect subsample, it's UV selected, but they are there. What do the SEDs apply? I'm sort of running out of time, so I'll skip the SEDs. But the thing I wanna show you is this big table. And if you circle the stellar masses, what do you see? These are galaxies at redshift eight, you know, drawn from all of cosmos, there's just a handful of them. But look at the masses, 10, 9, 9.8. These are actually in that mass range that the curve predicts. So potentially these are the progenitors of M87 at redshift eight, right? And we can actually now like connect the dots on this. And I would argue that it is sort of like a furniture company model, right? It's not super accurate, um, but we start to see a picture emerging. And of course, Toft was very clever. He preempted us all of this about 10 years ago. And this is from his paper. I will show you that this is basically right. Some of the redshifts that he wrote along the top here, I think are wrong, I'll show you that. But in general, this idea holds, right? So his prediction was, you know, a galaxy like M87 comes from major gas rich mergers at high redshifts, dusty starbursts, and AGN quenches it. It becomes a compact quiescent galaxy, grows through dry merging and becomes something like M87. I mean, there are the Stefanon redshift eight starbursts, right? He had the more at redshift five or six. They're probably more at redshift eight. Here are the, you know, Rikers and others, Redshift 6 SMGs. You know, here is the forest at all galaxies, these quenched galaxies at Redshift 3 to 4. You know, here are the Van Dockum and many other quiescent galaxies that are compact growing in size. And there is M87 on the bottom. This is really potentially the right life history for M87. Uh, and so where am I going next? Right. Everything disappears. And so, you know, it's actually sort of a model. <laughs> However, uh, this is really tenuous, what's going on here, right? I mean, I'm just showing you the tip of the iceberg of what we can do, and James Webb is going to do a lot. AGN may do the quenching of galaxies, but the physics is not very well known. And of course, this minor merging growth is probably right, but still unproven. And I would argue that, you know, this redshift range of, you know, eight to two, uh, there's a huge amount of progress to be made here. And of course, the way to do it is with James Webb, right? James Webb is, is our new view on the high redshift universe. It is hard to get the large volumes to see these rare massive galaxies, but we will do it over time. Just to give you in my last couple slides, oops. No, Microsoft, how dare you? Where is my Bill Gates? Okay. So just to give you a taste of what we're seeing in James Webb, uh, this is from Carnal. Um, he actually has a spectrum of this, which I should be showing, but here's, you know, a massive quiescent galaxy at redshift four and a half. You can see stellar mass of close to 10 to the 11, uh, redshift of four and a half, you know, nice SED, looks reasonable to me. Perhaps even more extreme is this result from Labe et al., which is looking at, you know, potentially massive galaxies at redshift seven to 10. Again, similar to the Ultra Vista, here's a stellar mass of 10 to the 10, you know, here's redshift eight, and there are, in some of the early James Webb fields, handfuls of these things. It is tricky to measure their masses, okay? Um, and this paper, if you followed it for the last six months as it's been refereed, has changed a lot. Um, but this is the final, this is the accepted version. So you can see these still have stellar masses of 10 to the 10 at redshift eight. Again, the kind of objects that we're predicting, okay? And I think what's exciting is some of these surveys are still ongoing, but 
In cycle one, you know, the James Webb tax have been smart enough to approve these sort of wide field programs, right? Things like Cosmos Web is doing like half a square degree. Primer covers about a quarter of a square degree. So does Jade's, their Sears. We can actually get to enough volume with some of these early James Webb surveys that we can see, you know, proto M87s at redshift six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10, who knows, and beyond, and really kind of fill in all these gaps. Okay, so... I hope I told you a good story today of M87, right? The life history of M87. I fully admit that it is a bit of, you know, the IKEA assembly of M87, but I hope, you know, James Webb is a five, 10 year mission. You have me back in five, 10 years. And instead of giving you the IKEA story, I'm gonna give you the whole blueprint, okay, of M87. So thanks so much for listening. Yeah, I don't Hey Adam, great talk by Thanks. the way. Uh, can you kind of do the same for the history of the mass of the central black hole? Can you do the same for the history of the mass of the central black hole? And do you mean like use the same kind of abundance matching techniques? Yeah, to see if the uh, mass of the supermass, the growth of the mass of the supermassive black hole. I mean, so in terms of the abundance matching, I guess in principle you can. I mean, the way that the abundance matching works is it uses simulations and it assumes some relationship between stellar mass and dark matter halo mass, and then you will can you know match the abundance. If you put dark ma if you put black hole masses into that, you could do the same thing. Of course, you know you may know better than me. Measuring black hole masses at high redshift is very very challenging, right? It's it is it is. I mean, you know the the gold standard is reverberation mapping, but it is very hard to do that at any. You know you need very very, um, you know you need bright AGN basically, and so it's hard to measure accurate masses at high redshift. So I think in principle you could, um, but it would be inaccurate. But I think it's a great thing to do because that of course is one of these main questions of you know how are the black holes you know growing with the galaxies. It's a good idea. Questions, uh... I was just wondering if you know how the environment the galaxies are in changes their mass growth or if it does at all. That's such a good question. Um, I didn't show any results on that. There was actually a paper written by Benedetto Volcani in 2016 where we looked at the environments of these galaxies. And we were really surprised with what we saw. There's a huge range. You know, some of these really massive, you know, say you go to these massive ellipticals at redshift two and three, your assumption would be every single one of these is like a central galaxy in a protocluster, right? And some of them are. Like you, you, you look around them and there's just tons and tons of other galaxies that really is a protocluster. And others just totally isolated. <laughs> Nothing else there. You look around, you look in photos of space. We've also done that because a lot of these observations were done with MOS fire. You have a lot of free slits. And so we have, you know, that's, that result is not published yet, but you can also not just use photos you can use spectroscopy. And it's this huge range, which is something that I don't really understand because my gut was like every one of these things is in a proto cluster. Um, it could be, you know, one of the things I've been thinking about is maybe it's the way it, it feeds, right? If how do you get to be so massive? Well, there's only one way, which is, well, you form a lot of stars, but you also eat your neighbors. And so potentially these ones that are isolated, they weren't, if I looked at them, you know, last year <laughs> or whatever, you know, they wouldn't be isolated. They just managed to have eaten all their friends today. And so they're, they're currently isolated. So it is a huge range of environments. We haven't been able to break them down you know, how it evolves differently in different environments. Because remember that all of this abundance matching is purely statistical. You kind of treat everything as being, you know, the same. Um, but there's probably a way to do that that would be really cool. But either way, it is very weird to me that they have such a wide range of, of environments. It's not at all what I would have expected. Yeah, so I, I guess I want to ask a question connected to that. So on the whole abundance matching or, or the Beruzzi method, yep. whichever one you want to choose, I mean, you're looking at an average trend there. Presumably there's a band of allowable values. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess I wonder if you have some thoughts on, you know, what does that say about the range of allowable outcomes? Like, can you, can <laughs> in, you know, you had this nice gradual build yep. up for M87. Yep. Yep. Uh, does it allow for, you know, maybe you got like a, you know, a strongly star forming thing halfway through your evolutionary track. Okay, so quiet and then. 
First of all, I thought we were friends, so thanks for that one. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, it's a great question, and it's a huge, it's a huge problem in this kind of thing. Now, you're absolutely right. This is an average. Okay, this is an average. This you can't see it very well here in gray, but this is kind of the dispersion you would get by taking that into account. However, that itself is even probably smooth because if you go to simulations, right, and and people have done this that I haven't showed. If you, if you go to numerical simulations, it's actually shocking how much of an even larger dispersion the simulations have. That things that were you know, very wimpy at high redshift, well, that are pretty massive at high redshift, they just flatline, they do nothing, right? And then you have things that were way down here that just come right up. I mean, the simulations are even, as you say, much, much you know, noisier. This is a very, very averaged out kind of um, smooth math gross. And it's a it's a huge problem with this analysis. I think some of the simulation stuff is so wild. Like you get some of these really absolutely unreal motions through this plane that you may question what's going on with the simulations, but absolutely this is an oversimplification. Unfortunately, with this kind of look back study thing, you know, there's not a lot of way around it, right? The only real way around it is to really get simulations and, and observations to line up at every redshift. And then instead of taking these tracks in the observations, you really would follow individual galaxies through a simulation and, and work it all out. Um, but, you know, that's tricky. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, I mean, I would say connected with those, I guess, reinforcing those simulations, people like here, like Alan and Dan have looked in CSI and found these like late bloomer galaxies. Yep, absolutely. They built up their mass relatively later in yep. time. And, you know. It's an open question, right? Well, and, and the question is, is that true? I mean, one of the interesting things is, um, you know, in the, the Thomas et al. stuff, right? And it, you know, there's not a lot of allowance for late bloomers, right? I mean, and even in the, you know, not even in the Thomas, but in the, you know, the mass age and, and mass metal, you know, there's not a lot of, you know, these things are all really old, right? There's not a population of like young thing, you know, massive galaxies that form their stars recently, right? They're all up here in the real universe. And this is one of the things that happens in the Sims that, you know, you can have big starbursts and massive galaxies because the AGN feedback breaks down. So I'm not saying this, well, you know, <laughs> there's problems with the observations. There's also problems with the simulations. And I think there is a long way to go to, to understand whether or not this smooth history is, is right. Um, I think we're probably both wrong at some certain degree and we need to kind of meet in the middle. Cool. Any other questions for Adam? Yeah, how about the reverse hierarchy of the solar mass? Do, do you see them in the simulations or? Yes, so I kind of wrote this, um, let's see. This doesn't show it very well. This kind of shows you, well, so let's be careful about reverse hierarchy. What I'm saying is um, in terms of, you know, building up stellar mass versus dark matter, that is reverse hierarchy. Dark matter is hierarchical. Stellar mass, you know, like big stuff forms later, or small stuff forms early in dark matter. Whereas the opposite was true with the stellar mass I showed you, right? The sims are much better than this. So this shows you that there's an offset between when the stars form and when the mass assembles. And that offset is like, if you measure it from this line here, it's like a couple giga years. So that number, if you went to simulations from 10, 15 years ago, was like the entire width of the plot, right? It would be like all the stars form at redshift six in every single galaxy, and then they all assemble into an elliptical at redshift point two, right? And so, you know, everything here would be like off the plot way over here. So the Sims have come a long way in having the early star formation and early assembly, assembly um, but it's not perfect. And um, I don't have the plot here, but if you go to the forest plot, we actually pull uh, the, the forest paper, we pull some of the results from TNG and show that in TNG, there are actually some galaxies that look like the forest galaxy, which have huge stellar masses and are a rich of three and a half. But the twist is, none of them are quenched. They're all still forming stars. So while this kind of thing is sort of roughly working out in the Sims, it's still not quite right. They still form a little bit too late and they still quench a little bit too late in the Sims. But it is, if you're old like me, I mean, it was really bad 15 years ago and the Sims have come really a long way. So it's mostly right. And I kind of said this at some point, you know, there's details that we need to to work out. Um, there's all sorts of, you know, carry the twos and that kind of stuff, but it's a lot closer to some sort of cohesive agreement. 
Uh, I think Adams, uh, Adam is here the rest of today. There's still a few uh, time slots if people want to meet with him one on one. And uh, if you'd like to go to dinner with us, just put your name on the start sheet. And uh, with that, let's thank Adam again. Thanks.